dust on my glasses and it feel I feel like most people don't clean their glasses that often but I find myself wiping them down like at least maybe five times a day. Wow. That seems sort of impressive. I don't think I wipe my glasses down five times a month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, only when when things get, you know, like completely occluded do I wash yeah. them. But, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, really clear, precise vision is is overrated. <laughs> no, I, I, I say that with... You know, with with years of experience, I, I don't. Um, I not this prescription, but the glasses I had before these, I wore the same pair for about twenty years. Really? Yeah, yeah. And only when I became um, a hazard on the road did I finally <laughs> change them. Yeah, <laughs> I used to joke with students in my classes that um, you you know because it's a thing, right? You want to get the students to sit as close to the front as possible mm-hmm. because it's easier to pay attention. But I would sort of half joke that, you know, that from the last two or three rows, I really, I, I, you know, I can't tell if you're a boy or a girl. Now. <laughs> I, I don't think you're allowed to make that joke anymore. I think that's... Um, but the, the corollary to that is that um, it isn't really so important. You know, it's... it's, it's well, I mean, yeah. maybe... F- well, is your... How bad is your vision? It's... Because um, I can tell you mine... Um, the right eye is like minus 10. Yeah. And my left eye is about minus 7.5 or something. So I, I, don't, I don't know those numbers. It's good to. It's good to. Yeah. I know that, that every now and again, every five or six or seven years, I'll get a new prescription. And when I put it on and look around, I'll be dizzy for a few minutes. Yeah. Only because yeah. I hadn't realized that things were actually quite so clearly defined as that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in old movies, you know, what, you know especially with... Um, you know, older, but women intended to be beautiful, they used a soft filter focus. Yeah. Um, and it was fine. Nobody in the audience complained. Yeah. It, yeah. That's more of a, um, like an artistic decision to alter the image so sli- ever so slightly to, to give that effect. But yeah. say if I, if I take off my glasses and everything looks uh, very soft and I can't see anything, like I would say about, around here is where things start to come into focus. Now, that's how bad my vision is. It, if this is a broadcast, does about here have any? <laughs> um, well, I, I, I have a similar, a similar. My about here is, is is about six or seven inches from my face. Yeah. But but what I'm, what I'm getting at is that you know that um it's not a it's not a given. It's not the only answer that things have to be precisely focused to be worth looking at. Okay. Yeah. At least for me, they have to be in focus enough that I'm actually seeing them because. Um, my vision is so poor. Oh, you wouldn't actually see them, right? No, not right. Really. No, my, mine is not that bad. <laughs> mine is, you know, it's just so bad. Just things would just be a little more beautiful. Like I've glasses. been, I've been wearing glasses since I was about five or six years old. Yeah. And what about you? Well, I probably needed them since I was five or six years old. I, I got glasses when I was about thirteen or fourteen when somebody finally noticed me squinting right. um, at something, and you know, even now it makes a kind of intuitive sense that as things get further away, they should get blurrier. Okay. I think about it, right? Like, yeah. it seems sort of logical. It's not actually true. Yeah. Yeah. But I just assumed that was the truth. You know, that, that things were supposed to get blurry and blurrier as they got further away. Yeah. And the, I was so not quite aware of what was happening when I was, like, say, I was in elementary school and you're, like, giving everyone, like, vision and hearing tests. Yeah. And I just, I took the test and... I just did the best I could, whatever, right? I didn't think about it. Yeah. And then sooner or later, they call my parents in, and they're like, something, something, your son needs glasses. I thought, that means I failed the test. Oh. I thought that meant, oh, I did something bad. Yeah, yeah. And is it, you know, it's not that kind of test, though. It's not right. um, a test of your aptitude. It's a test to see if you're seeing clearly. I thought, and I conflated that idea, so, so I felt like, oh, I, I just failed at seeing, and that was bad. yeah. It raises kind of interesting question in general. I'm not sure that, um, I don't know, like, should understanding be subject to more sanction than seeing? You know, awareness, reading ability. I mean, it, if what you're saying is true, it makes me think that, you know, the whole paradigm of failure and passing is probably overplayed, you know? I mean, because yeah. remember, like, when you were a kid, didn't you? Maybe you didn't. We were kids at different times. But we used to have days during the term, not a lot of them, maybe a week every six months, where we had to take a whole battery, as in six hours a day worth of standardized testing. Really? Yes. And it was a thing. I mean, when I say it was a thing, I mean it was like 150 students in the cafeteria for six hours filling out 
you know, little black ovals with our pencils yeah. until pencil nubs got worn down. Like it was a thing. But but to take your point, like let's say those tests reveal that my understanding or reading abilities were somehow, you know, um, outside below the normative range. Is it really fair to say I failed those? You know, maybe your eyes aren't as good. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah it seems it seems harsh. No. That's different than a, something where you're expected to prepare, I suppose. Yeah. I don't think I've ever... You never have tests like I that? I never had to sit at a desk to take a test for more than a couple hours at a time. I mean, I mean, literally, like like a whole week, classes would be canceled. Like a whole grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, whatever it was, was shuffled into, you know, like the gymnasium and the cafeteria, and we just have to fill out ovals for just hours and hours and hours. At least um, during my time at my institutions, they were like, maybe to take the PSAT, all the sophomores right, would right. be like... That you don't have to go to class during this week on this particular day because we're going to be cycling through all the all the kids to take the PSATs. Well, we did those too. I remember yeah. those. Yeah, th- these were we, the tests I'm talking about were not dissimilar in their in their like huge cohort at once, but it was in every grade. It was in third grade, fourth grade, fifth okay. grade, sixth grade. Sixth. You know, it might have been one of the you know it's like things about your childhood are very hard to uh, to judge accurately because you only have one. Yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing to compare it. Too, but um, it's probably something they don't do anymore. I don't know. But I don't I, think so. But don't aren't, aren't what? What do they mean? I don't know much about contemporary high school education. They talk about teaching to the test. There are huge standardized tests, aren't yeah. there? Yeah. Like um, you know, I grew up in Connecticut. Throughout my years, I was taking the Connecticut Mastery Test for up until like high school, to to uh-huh. to, to track you know the progress of my mastery of I don't know reading comprehension and math and whatever. So maybe it was maybe it was like that. Maybe it was the New Jersey version of that, and the New Jersey versions of things tend to be a little less pleasant. So it could have just been that. Okay. Yeah. So um, I ask you a question regarding glasses. Um, so I've been tempted. Uh, my colleagues T Stores, for example, had this done years ago to get LASIK surgery to correct my eyes. But you, you also have glasses. You have not had this surgery too. Is no. This, are you tempted to do this? Um. The thing is, I think I'm the progression of my nearsightedness has me like right on the cusp oh. of, I would say, being recommended for LASIK because you can only restore vision to a certain extent, f- fully restore someone's vision via LASIK to a certain ex- extent. And I think I'm right on the cusp. So, so you might not be a candidate for it. That's why you I might not. It done. Or if I okay. if I do and it ends up being a viable option, there might be. Like the most, it all depends on how much like of your cornea they can laser off or something like that. And if you, it also depends on like the thickness of your corneas, cornea. And the, perhaps if I have the average uh, thickness of my cornea, if they, if I were to do LASIK, it might not be enough to fully correct my vision. Yeah. But I would, if if I were given the chance, I would totally do it. You would to, totally do it. to reduce my dependency on wearing eyeglasses. Yeah. Well, you make a you make a case for it. Um. So you might not be a candidate for it. I think I am a candidate for it. And I just I can't. You know, the idea of like like lasering off part of my cornea. It's just it's just a hard pill for me to swallow. Yeah. I don't know that I want. Even you know, like if it's good in the long run, I don't know that I want somebody lasering off parts of my cornea. <laughs> I mean, no, it's, 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 you know, in every procedure, in every, every part, you know, there's going to be people who are good at their jobs and people who are less good at their jobs. <laughs> yeah. And, and you don't know. You, you don't, don't want know. the new guy. That's right. Um, put, putting right. lasers in your eyes. That's right. They're not going to tell you, oh, this was her first cornea until after the procedure. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to be, you're not going to be front loaded with that information. This was the first so. time. Yes. I'm, I know this was my first time. You can't get LASIK twice or not, not commonly. He's like, no, I mean the, the, <laughs> exactly. The, the, opto- yeah. the optometrist first yeah, time. First time. LASIK. Yeah. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, you know, granted, you know, such things don't happen often, but um, I, don't know, I don't know they happen. So, yeah. But I think about it. I think about it. You like the idea of, say, correcting your vision and not being uh, dependent on wearing eyeglasses, but it's the it's the lasers in your eyes. It's the lasers. I, also, I, I like, there's a few things. I like the idea of, um, I have been told that with Lasix, you see better than with the best glasses, that it, it's a level of improvement that with glasses, right? Like, yeah. like it's very, like, I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to, like, 
Like it's like conceiving of another color or hearing in a different register. Like what does that mean? Like I see better than, I mean, I can't even conceive. There's no way perhaps to conceive of that without experiencing it. Like seeing sharper than you've ever seen at your sharpest. What does that look like? Hmm. Yeah. So I'm tempted, especially because I like science fiction movies. And, you know, let's face it, the, you know, more clearly you can see the, you know, the more intense the effects are. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm tempted. So I've had glasses long enough that I honestly can't remember what it feels like to say, wake up. Exactly. Not exactly. be nearsighted. Or, for example, when, when you were in college, that's sort of a joke. Um, <laughs> w- w- when I was in college, they used to have uh, these cool uh, stick on, they maybe still do, stars that people would put on the ceilings of their dorm rooms. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, like, you know, those who were like a little OCD would, would match the constellations and actually put up the stars in ways that were accurately reflecting the night sky. Right. But if you wear glasses, unless you're going to lie there in bed, with glasses on, looking up at the, right? Like, that's only cool if you don't wear glasses. Yeah. Because I, 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 you know, I wanted those when I was a college student. So things like that, I'm tempted. You know, or, or, or being able to, for example, watch TV in bed and um, actually fall asleep with the TV on, which I can't do because I can't fall asleep with my glasses on. Yeah. If I'm really tired. Yeah. So you have to make that conscious decision to remove your glasses yeah. and go to bed. Or um, the, just like, Waking up and looking at your alarm clock and you can see the time. That's right. That's right. Or, or looking out the window and, you know, being able to tell if it's raining or snowing out or whatever. I mean, sometimes the quality of light yeah. will tell you, but actually to see it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I would love to reduce my dependency on wearing eyeglasses so that I'm like my, bo- my the way I'm put together, my body runs kind of hot and having glasses on, my glasses are black and so they absorb light and heat up. And also this, um, this extra amount of surface area being in contact with my skin this, and the added amount of friction of them just being on my face, it makes me sweat more than I would like to, even when I'm not perhaps doing anything partic- particularly strenuous. Oh, oh, come on, really? Yeah. Well, maybe so. I don't know. I, 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 again, this is not really something that would translate well on a cod- cat podcast, but I, I encourage you to... Um, Right, those would not make you. I've just handed my glasses across the table. Those would not make you sweat additionally. No, not not quite. Me, but because mine are um, they're not as um, those are skinny frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're 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 um, they're titanium. They weigh like, I mean, you know, they, they weigh less than a, less than a Ritz cracker. I mean, yeah. they're they're yeah, but heavy frames. Not that I can imagine. Maybe that's a different. That's even worse. You know. Yeah. So yeah, and um, the thing is, I have tested this out. Like there are days when um. Like, I'll wear contacts today because, oh, I'm going to be out and about all day. I'm going to be, like, moving around, maybe lifting things. Like, I don't want to have to wear my glasses and, like, be sweating way more and then have the chance of sweat, like, getting on my glasses, like, uh, on the lenses. It's all like, that'll be a day. I'm going to wear my contacts and it'll it'll be less. It'll be less stressful. So I've got two thoughts. One is related to, um, you know, reading. Uh, which is, do you take your glasses off when you read? No, I need these to read. Are you wearing bifocals? Well, if I were to read, it'd be like this. Oh, wow, wow, and Again, wow. I'm saying wow, like this on a podcast. Are, yeah, <laughs> yours are, but yours are really, your yeah. eyes are really screwed up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mine are not that screwed up. I can read without my glasses. The problem is I don't because who wants to take your glasses off? You know, like put them on, where are you going to put them? Put them on the table. A cat's going to start playing with them. Yeah. Right? It's just, it's just a mess waiting to happen. So as a result, I read with my glasses on all the time, which you shouldn't do. It just makes your eyes worse. So glasses are a mechanism for causing further damage. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, because that's a problem. I think part of, um, well, Asians are more predisposed to just having poor vision. Is that true? Yeah. And oh. so, which is why I started young. My vision started right, right, d- right. deteriorating when I was young. But then it was further exacerbated by the fact that I was into reading when I was a kid. So I read a lot of books, stayed inside, was just reading a lot. And so having focusing on text just like a foot from your face for a long for long periods of time, that's you know, that's gonna that's gonna make it worse. So so um how come you're not wearing contacts now? Uh because I don't have a lot of the money to spend on uh, contacts. So So I tend to parse them out, parse out the days that I wear them. In fact, I just this past month, I purchased another set of contacts, which by the way, because 
there are different prescriptions for each eye, have to buy a box for each one. Yeah. And so, and my particular brand of contacts, it's like 70 bucks a box. Well, how many are in a box? Six. Well, how, how long can you wear one before it has to be replaced? A month. Oh, well, okay. Well, that's, that's yeah. pretty good. And yeah. they're, not only that, but I have astigmatism. These have to be like specialty lenses, torque lenses, which I suppose adds to the cost. And the, so the amount of pres- the prescription and the, this, the, the fact that they're torque and that they're monthlies, I, I once tried like the dailies or the two week kind of lenses and they, they, they did not agree with my eyes at all. Yeah. They, 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 uh, they were painful. And so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll just go, I'll stick with this brand because that's what feels comfortable. And so, and because I'm not very, I don't have a lot of cash to spend on, on lenses, I have to, for one, I never buy more than one box per eye at a time because right there, even it, that's like $140 worth of, of, right. of lenses. 70 each. Even yeah. if I have in the, like a partic- particular year, I have my insurance that covers a certain amount of, of the lenses, my, it's, I'm still spending like $30, $40 on it, right? Because I have a limited supply of contact lenses, I have to I make sure they last two years because... What it usually does is I get a new frame. I'm eligible for a new frame for my glasses every two years. So I kind of alternate. Use the insurance to get a new frame this year. Next year, use the insurance to cover some of the cost of my contact lenses. Yeah. And so I am only ever have a six-month supply for two years. And so I have to parse out, like, spread out the days, the cumulative 30 days that I would be wearing a, a particular set of lenses. Well, that seems complicated. Maybe Bernie Sanders will help you out <laughs> with that. Um, yeah. Well, as I, I mean, where I was going with this is, is uh, you know, just to ask, because um, I find the concept of contact lenses really, really disturbing. Have you never worn them? No, no, and I never will. I, the idea of putting something on my eyes just, just un, just nearly unfathomable it's, to me. It's rather unnatural. Yeah, exactly. It's like exactly. When, um, when, I fir- yeah. when I was first getting contacts, they have to give you, like, a ses- a training session where you practice yeah putting them in your eye because your eye if you're sticking something near it is going to say like no no you don't and then you have to train your eye to not react so reactively yeah. to to yeah. you put sticking something in your eye I don't want my I mean I feel like my eye's desire not to have things stuck in or on it is wholly laudable and I want to encourage it I don't I don't want to train my eye to to not like react <laughs> against that like there's a, a test they do for your vision last time I got glasses they tried to do this where they blow a puff of air against your eye yeah yeah and and like I remember I was there when they were getting it done they they, they probably tried two or three times finally the doctor actually called in a nurse to hold me down so they could do it <laughs> and and at that point i just said you know we're not going to do this test today you know this this is you need oh. to put this away oh, yeah yeah because yeah. i i don't know i mean i guess some people just are better at mastering that sort of thing but to me it's just like i don't want to like put something on the surface of my eye that's just that's horrifying well, it yeah. took me i think i think for at least for most people it does take a while to, yeah it took me a while i think it was like a good hour of me um trying to t- to tell my eye, please stay open so I can put this in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I'm, I'm a distance runner. Um, and uh, every now and again, you know, I'll get home from a, a run and there will be bugs on the surface of my eye. Yeah. You know, dead, obviously, but <laughs> just, you know, like, like just like splayed wings, yeah. just kind of on the, on the windshield of your eye. Basically, that's yeah. right. That's, that's, that's what's going on there. And, and just, to, you know, getting those, those things off is quite a process. Yeah. 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 It's just, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I can, I suppose one could just, Put your finger on your eye and wipe them off. But I, yeah, Ugh, no, not me. Yeah, it's interesting. It sounds like the hesitations I have, you don't have. That you're really making more resource allocation decisions as opposed to just like being horrified by some of the processes that go on, you know, regarding your eyes, which is which is understandable. Yeah, but I also think you know, like glasses as a cultural signifier or another reason to, you know, to keep them. I mean, I feel like to wear glasses is to, in some ways you know, identify yourself with kind of more of a, of a literary kind of, I don't know, like value system. Yeah. Like, you know, I remember the, when, um, I think it was Jenny McCarthy became part of the presenters of like the view or something like that. Okay. And they decided to just 
you could tell it was like, oh, just put glasses on her. She'll look real smart and yeah. be able to talk about things. Yeah, she's still an anti-vaxxer, though. <laughs> so she's she's not. I mean, Jenny McCarthy is a is a is is a fool with a um, pedestal, pulpit, podium. I'm not sure what the word word is, but but she's not. We don't want to talk about her. You need to put more. You need to put glasses on her and 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 a, a gag because <laughs> she says some stupid shit. So yeah, yeah. and there is this uh, this association with you know wearing the glasses and you look more bookish. Bookish. Or, that's the word. Yeah. I, yeah, I said literary, but bookish. That's the one. And Thank you. I, perhaps, at least for me, it was like a convergence where I think if I didn't need glasses, I would still be, well, this, like rather bookish, read a lot yeah, and, and do stuff like that. But but then the wearing the glasses like really reinforce that. It does. It does. It helps. It, it's like uh, it helps bookish people find each other. It's like a pheromonal scent. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is. It is. As a matter of yeah. fact. On, on, it's a phenotype they look for. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. On, I, you know, for, for assorted, you know, like dating applications or whatever, I used to remove my glasses. And then at some point I realized, like, like hell no, right? Because for just what you're saying, you know, like it's a way to advertise. I mean, obviously it's not like one-to-one correspondence, but bookishness. Yeah, and, but also know, like readers, want, readers are sexy. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I think. No, I didn't. You that. want the people interested in your like Tinder profile to like recognize you. Like kind of like with your driver's license, they want you to not smile and like say if you wear glasses, wear your glasses. Right. Exactly. Ex- exactly. Right. Like you want to set up. Not. I mean, it's not a question of good or bad expectations. It's a question of truth and advertising. It's you know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No. Right. Like. Yeah. Like. 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 Look. You know. You're. You're going to find this mm. out sooner or later. So let's just put it all out now and, you know, and and move forward. Yeah. On on firmer ground. Yeah. yeah. And um, I I suppose. I don't advertise myself so much, except for say through my website for the podcast. Sure, mm-hmm. where it's um it's a very flippant tone as you're reading the information. First of all, the name of the show is the podcast with Benson Ty. Yeah, and then like the subtitle is the best podcast you'll ever hear with this title, and then the the biggest font thing on the page is it says I talk to people and record it. I'm putting it all out there, and I want to make it a bit humorous because that's that's kind of my so sh- is is the idea that the the lack of uh, embellishment is the embellishment you could say yeah okay yeah, yeah because like the way it's just really because because of the format for the most part i'm just talking to people i don't want it to be more not more than it actually is you know what i mean i do i do hmm i don't i don't yet understand podcast um like like the varieties, the kinds, like like podcast culture. I don't. I'm not sure I get it yet. Um, what what exactly is um, mystifying you? Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so partially it's like um, like how is it? Do, do you know Terry Gross, for example? Yes, from Fresh Air. That's the one I mean. Yeah. So how is how is a podcast different than say radio? Yeah. Um, I mean, aside from I understand the. So let me let me let me frame that question. So I, I I understand the technical differences. You can listen to whatever you want. It's not offered. The, but 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 what I mean is in terms of a flavor and or culture, right? Because that's that's the interesting thing. Not the not the um, the material, but how the material affects the objects being made. Oh, okay. Yeah. The cultural impact of say of podcast versus radio you mean well or 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 how the medium affects the message so i know what radio is i know what radio shows are like yeah how was the i say i want to say mise-en-scene mise-en-scene if that's how you pronounce it yeah yeah, yeah i'm talking about reader i never know film major here yeah. all right how is the mise-en-scene thank you different in a podcast um that's that's what i want to know Vincent. i think for the most part pretty much anyone can start a podcast okay you don't have to go through the regular channels of, say, radio, find a radio station, approach someone, be like, I want to have a radio show, and then have to, like, approve you. The, like, the way I started my podcast was just, um, I'll get some mics, and I'll just, like, talk to people. So, no gatekeeping. How does no gatekeeping affect... Now, see, now I'm thinking of the difference between, That means like, the pod... Yeah. The podcast, whatever podcast you make, can be anything you want. Okay. Like, there are shows like mine where it's just, like, having conversations with people. There are podcasts that are, like, themed around something. Like, say, um, if I had a show that was just me talking to people, like, about the new movies that are coming out. Or there are, like, true crime podcasts that are, like, them trying to – they're about, like, cold cases that are interesting. Or 
the biggest name in past few years is like Serial, if you've heard of it, where they try to like investigate a murder that happened years ago and find out what really happened and if they could exonerate the um, convicted because it's based on the evidence. It seems like there is a chance he did not do it. There's there's stuff like that, but also like say people, their entire podcast dedicated to say a TV show. There's one called the X Files Files by Kumail Nanjiani, stand up comedian and actor who has been defunct for a few years. But it was him having people on to like they watch an episode of the X Files and then they talk about it. So you've told me how the subject matter differs. Yeah, but that's not really what I'm asking. I'm not going to say it right. Mise en scène? Mise en scène. Yeah, so how does that differ? Let me give you an example. Um, let, me, let me not. Let me, give you, <laughs> let me give you a simile instead. Okay. I mean, the difference between, let's say, instant oatmeal and, like, steel-cut oats when you cook them. Like, how is the texture different? Oh, okay. That's what I don't, that's what I don't I'll, quite I'll get tell you, yet. Okay, so if you're in a radio station, you have a lot of people who work in... Radio, sound, production. Yeah. And they can make it sound really professional, really produced. But for the most part, because there is no uh, gatekeeping in terms of podcasting, there's, I bet you there's lots of um, shows like, say, mine, that sound a little rough around the edges. They're not very, uh, they don't sound very professional, or I guess the subject ma- the content, the subject matter may reinforce the unprofessionalism of, of the show. And is, is that in podcasts a virtue? Could you make a rubric of what makes a good podcast? What makes a good podcast? Um, I would say if you like listening to it. Yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what a good podcast would be. Well, see, I, I, that, doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't answer the question. That does answer a useful question, but not really. Is, is it even possible to completely get rid of like, any standards of objective value? Are there, are there none? Is it all subjective taste? So you're trying you're trying to find a way to objectively judge a pod the value of a podcast. I'm trying the, the quality to understand of what makes a good podcast a good podcast. So I understand that you know that there's there's going to be less gatekeeping. I understand there's going to be you know no commercial considerations. Although I guess there's none in NPR. Um, well, I mean, right, nice polite Republicans. But what what exactly <laughs> is is like if I'm making a podcast, right? Like if we were talking about poems, um, I could I could differentiate. I'd be glad to. What I like in poetry yeah. and what makes a good poem. And there are some ways in which those over, overlap, mm-hmm. but there are some ways in which they do not. You know, it would be, it would be the utmost of arrogance, I think, to say that, the sa- that they're the same in that my tastes are a standard of good. If I can't differentiate my tastes from um, quality, yeah. then, you know, then, then I'm not, right? Then I'm, you know, I'm just looking at my belly button. Yeah. I'm looking at my belly button and, and making rules for art. Because podcasts are, a platform for entertainment, it is inherently subjective based on how entertaining it is for an individual person. I don't, I, but every, I, I don't know. Yeah. Eh. I mean, I, again, I think that's, that's throwing away the critical facility and I don't want to do that. Okay. I don't want to do that. For example, um, I don't know. Do you like, I don't know, let's say like Jello. Okay. Do you? Sure. Okay. I do like Jello. Good. All right. I do too. All I'm vegetarian. Don't eat it. Haven't 25 years, but I do like it. I remember what it tastes like. But I would not argue that it is a good food. No. Nor would I want to make the argument that, that there is no other objective standard for food other than tastes. Okay. So that my, my preferment of jello is equal to your preferment of, I don't know, like, you know, your, your mom's, whatever the heck your mom makes, it's good. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I do think that there's, there's, there's got to be both. We got to have standards of taste. And um, rubrics, you know, to understand the values of things. So, like, judging whether or not a podcast is, say, mentally nourishing? Well, I don't know. Like, maybe it is mentally nourishing, but or maybe not. Maybe the, the way to judge a good po- podcast is that um, it, is, it is in its alinearity and the fact that it goes unexpected places, that it, it travels an arc which may not be, let's say, educational, but is unpredictable and yeah. energetic. I would say that's one standard we use to value good poems. Good poems are not linear. Uh, they ride on their own melting, uh, so says Robert yeah. Frost, like butter on a hot stove. Yeah. yeah. Actually, this is a perfect kind of metaphor for what, at least what I consider like a good podcast, 
or what I aspire my podcast to be because it's just conversations between people. It's not necessarily me just like interviewing you, answering, asking you questions and having you answer them. It's just a free flowing the conversation goes wherever it does. Like mm -hmm. at the beginning, we were talking about eyeglasses for like 20 minutes and now we've meandered through until we got into this very meta uh, segment of us talking about what makes a good podcast. So podcasts are collaborative. Podcasts are unpredictable. At least for the particular, say, genre I'm going for. Okay. Unpredictability is an asset. See, I'm, 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 I'm liking the collaborative one, too, because I'm thinking about something like Fresh Air with Terry Gross, which I think, um, I think she comes in with questions. I think that is much less yeah, collaborative. She is, she is an interviewer. Yeah. I don't consider myself an interviewer. Right. Are you an interlocutor? Yeah, it's you, you have interlocutor. A, interloc <laughs> I, well, actually, I've heard interlocutor, too. So okay. I'm, I'm taking the... the I'm never going to say it right. Mise-en-scene? Mise-en-scene. Yeah, that one. Um, anyway, but yeah. So, I mean, that's maybe a different, there's a different word for that. Interlocutor or whatever you want to say. Yeah. So, I don't consider myself an interviewer. Yeah. Be, if there, I mean, sometimes I'd say it's an interview because that's the word that gets the idea across best. But like, it's not really what Like, it I'm gonna, we're going to sit across from each other and we're going to talk to each other. Sometimes that idea of just having a conversation between people who happen to have mics in front of their faces doesn't really – some people don't really get it the first time I say it to them. I'm like, oh, it's an interview. I'm like, oh, okay. So, so I got, I, I'm, th I'm mulling another difference here. Um, and again, I'm, I'm limited. But like one of the things about interviews is that you ask people the things – you ask people about the things that referred them to your interest. Yeah, but, but podcast, it does not sound like you do. I mean, I'll tell you this. For the first few episodes, I did kind of, the idea was the initial itinerary for the podcast was to have talks with people that were more conversations than they were interviews. Mm -hmm. I would have... I wanted them to be conversations that skewed just a little bit towards interviews. Uh -huh. The first couple of guests I had on were friends of mine who were like photographers. Some of that was like ask, me asking them like, oh, what, what um, got you interested in photography? And like what exactly draws your eye? What, what do you aspire to do with it? Right? And now um, after doing X amount of episodes, I want it to be more just people talking. It doesn't have to be me, um, say, facilitating the conversation in order to feed, in order to service, say, it's a couple of questions I might have. Hmm. Yeah. I think, I, 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 I don't know. Like, some people are fascinating in localized ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would, I mean, I think that the, the idea of the interviews, you, you, you know, you hit where the, you know, the, where, where you're likely to have the deepest and uh, purest ore. Yeah. You know, you, 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 know, you dig, dig where you think the, the gold is likely to be. I mean, do you, do you ever podcast, interview people, excuse me, um, and, and just think, geez, you're, you're kind of dull. <laughs> I mean, some people are. You know, as a matter of fact, I mean, you know, some, some of my best friends are pretty dull people. They have other qualities that recommend yeah, them. Um, but um, I'll tell you this. I've had a couple. Yeah. Where... I have done a couple where it did feel like the energy was not right. Yeah. The, like they weren't picking up what I was throwing down in terms of the format, right? So, but right. So you not only need somebody who, who, who can return the ball. Yeah. But, but also somebody who's got things to say that are like, I don't know. In interesting. I was thinking compelling, but, or, but interesting at least. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's why I like to try to approach it just as a conversation between people. I don't want you to feel kind of guarded, uptight, because you feel like you're being interviewed. I want the energy to be casual. I want, I just want them to be themselves to say like just the things that come to their minds because we're just talking. I, I do. I'm just not sure. I don't know. Like I guess I feel. I mean, in some ways, I'm kind of um, old guard. Um, there's certain values maybe that I have that aren't completely in fashion. And one of them might be that, that, that to some extent I do want to hear people, you know, on, on a, on a, something like a radio show or, a, um, I, I do want to hear people do what they do best or, or, um, you know, spark their genius for me. Right. You know, like, yeah, like, like, um, I mean, people, people do this. This is, I think, a, um, you know, like a, a thing people do is they'll get famous people 
on their, you know, like podcasts and they'll ask them questions about things that are not related to what makes them famous. Right. Yeah. And, and I understand why it, it humanizes. It's a democratic, democratizing impulse. It, um, it fits our cultural moment, which has no use, little use for education and expertise. Right. Like we're, we're very anti that sort of globally. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm as interested in, in what like famous person A or B, how they feel about things that are not related to their fame. In other words, I think there's something to be said for, 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 for getting people where they're most there might, accomplished. There's, um, I think there's a fine line between that being great and not, and it being kind of bad. Maybe, like maybe I remember, so. I remember I was like just watching TV someday and there was like, interstitial from MTV, them asking questions, asking this band questions. Right? Yeah. And they were n- not meaningful or thoughtful in any way and not related to their work as a band or anything. And it was just a quick little <laughs> thing, right? And I felt, after watching that, I felt like that didn't need to happen ever. Yeah. In that case, it was poorly executed and made for um, shit content. But in terms of, say, me podcasting someone, it's a long form kind of thing. We're just talking off the cuff. But I, I hope most of the time we end up saying interesting things to each other. In that case, I would say it's executed well and it makes for good content that people might enjoy listening to. So my, my counter proposition is that um, the most interesting things that I have to say would probably be related to, you know, like what I've taken up to be the focus of my life's work. Okay. I don't know. That may not be true. As a matter of fact, I may not have interesting, to th- interesting things to say on any particular subject. That is entirely possible. But, but if I were going to lay odds, I would think that my insights into poetry, which I've spent lots of time thinking about and do regularly, are probably better than my insights into glasses. Right. Because, because I got to say, like, my particular, like, I like neuroses. I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're not all that interesting. I mean, they're true. No, you know, I'm not. But yeah. I mean, what do you think about that? Like, isn't there something to be said for, like, I don't know, like, what, are, what, what fascinates you? Just the, the way people work. They, like, what makes them tick, not say in their, in like the field that they're known for, like, say, for you, poetry, but more like just them as people. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do. I do. This may be may be kind of a like a, a humanist sort of bias that that I oh, I guess I don't have quite so much in that way because like I was very interested to hear your thoughts on podcasts, which is I guess why I started asking you questions about it because that's something that I don't know about and you do know about. Yeah. And so like to me that's like okay, you know, like here I'm going to get a chance to hear and learn something which you know will will fill out develop my understanding of the world, um, which is why for example I didn't ask you about your preferences making breakfast because i feel like i sort of know about breakfast <laughs> so so you know like 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 things that are are i don't know yeah like i want to do deep dives yeah. and, and the deepest dives are going to be where expertise is okay yeah but i mean you know we live in a cultural moment right like look who we elected president like we were like expertise is just not on the table <laughs> anymore it's not it's not you know we're no. we, we want people who are relatable um and and part of what relatable means not only that expertise is less interesting but that expertise is to some extent alienating or off-putting yeah yeah which which i don't know i worry about because you know i mean there's certain applications for example laser surgery on your eye where you want as good an expertise as humanly possible yeah that that you know like yeah yeah that, that it is it is underrelated i love listening to people you know who really know their stuff a, a good example maybe it was a couple of years ago um but we had helen vendler the critic helen vendler here to speak and i don't even remember what she spoke about she spoke about all right i do she, it was a poem by wallace stevens um the palm at the end of the mind and i don't really know the poem very well and i've never particularly loved wallace stevens but just listening to a brilliant person speak about um, there, I mean, it's like prestidigitation, right? I mean, she was yeah. pulling rabbits out of hats, um, just left and right. And, and to me, that's, that's a different sort of, the, the podcast experience is not that, right? Like she was giving a prepared paper and in some way that's the opposite of a yeah. podcast experience. Kind of. Yeah. But then there are times when, but that's what I love. Um, when like I yeah. listen to podcasts and like the people talking, they just give out really intriguing insights about whatever yeah and and you figure man they're fascinating they're just they're just they're off the cuff conversation they throw out this bit that just like that's 
that's real fascinating. You know? So, so from my idea of of um, you know like linguistic perfection is poetry, which is also in some ways opposite, where where every word has been um, raku fired. Well, even that's you know an element of, of randomness in it, where 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 everything has been looked at. The poet has has perhaps not in the course of composition, but but at least in the course of revision and finishing work, has examined every choice, every possible choice on the page and has um, ratified it, either by, you know, like changing it to what it needs to be or or confirming that the initial impulse, um, you know, was right. You know, like that that model of perfection. And 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 there are other other models of beauty out there and the podcast clearly is one, but it's not it's not what. Yeah. You know, it's the it's the difference between um, the raw and the cooked, right? The Apollonian, Apollonian and Dionysian aspects of art. I've always been an Apollonian. Podcasters have a Dionysian soul. That's my that's my thesis for the day. Okay. Like to be a podcaster, yeah, you know that you're all about the drunken wine and revelry, about what happens in the moment, the spontaneous creation, as opposed to burnishing something until it's perfect and only then showing it to the world. Well, yeah, I mean, at least for this. Um, particular type of podcast is aesthetic. Yeah, that's what it is. But there's, you know, there's. Still, Are there other types of podcasts? Yeah, like um, I listened to one where it's about sound phenomenon, and it's very much a like kind of educational, a scripted. This guy telling you about like this, like shepherd tones or whatever, and it's meant to just hey. You want to learn about shepherd tones? I'm going to talk about shepherd tones. So, so okay. So there's there's a range in podcasts that I didn't even know is out there. You can, like I said before, a podcast can be anything you want. But I do think that the the medium, or even uh, like audio dramas, right? So, yeah. So if if the medium is the message, right? That that thesis to some extent. What is the message of the medium of podcasts? That's what I don't understand yet. One of the things, anyway. I think the answer would be it depends. Yeah, that's not. That's, that's, not, that's, that's, a, that's a vacating of answer. <laughs> Maybe the answer is it's a few things. I wonder if poets have podcasts where, I mean, would you call that a podcast if on a website a poet read his or her, their work? Would that it be could a podcast? Be. You could totally do it. Does a podcast imply a regularity like a program? Sure. It does. Like, um, say, I would say if you want it to work as a, an, its own self-contained entity, there should be like a theme or continuity to it because like say with my show, the continuity between episodes is me having a one-on-one conversation with someone. That's a theme. You're the continuity. Uh, Kind of. Yeah. And it's my personality as I talk to people and to say their personalities colliding with mine. Yeah. Well, that's that that is like to me like a radio show. Like, I mean, everybody I know who listens to Terry Gross, myself included, has has kind of a thing for Terry. Yeah, you know, I mean, you feel sort of like she's like you know her because you've oh, listened it, to her so much. Yeah, yeah, right. But but with all of the save the biblical implications of the word no, right? Like you feel like she's your buddy. Like yeah. you don't just know her. Like you know, like me and Terry, like we're like a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's totally not true. Not quite, no. Do you think when people, I mean, I wondered, I mean, I guess that happens. People feel the same way. That you listen to a podcast because you develop, among other reasons, a relationship with the podcaster. People feel like they know you. Yeah. You like, like hearing Benson's it, thing. Well, if, if some people like it, uh, thank you. Yeah. But yeah, like some that's like that's it. kind of the reason for for podcasts like this where it's conversations between, between people. I feel like the reason people keep coming back to it would be because they enjoy the personality of of the host of like say if people happen to like me they they're listening because they enjoy um, my personality on the show and the way I conduct conversations with other people. It's if you listen to Terry Gross, have you ever listened to any of the shows? There are a few different ones where people, for different reasons, have walked out on her. Oh, like I heard just recently. The actor Adam Driver yeah. walked out because yeah. he's, he has this anxiety about like watching or listening to him, himself perform, and they were he was promoting a movie, yeah, and they played a clip from the movie, and he's like he got real uncomfortable because he doesn't like hearing that, yeah, and so he walked out. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very funny. I think also I don't remember if the lead singer of of was the lead singer of Kiss or lead singer of some like uh, rock band. Yeah, also walked out on her, and um, oh gosh. 
uh, maybe Bill O'Reilly sort of famously. Yeah. I think he walked out on her sort of hostily. Um, those moments are sort of delicious. <laughs> but but I think they're they're delicious for the reason you say is because they're, you know, like they're sort of shocking. Like someone's someone's dissing your friend. Like you can't believe it. I remember I think I remember an episode of Fresh Air where Terry Gross was interviewing Gene Simmons from Kiss. He's is is this the one where yeah, what happened? He's I think it was um she mispronounced his his um birth name, which is very it's a very Jewish birth name. Yeah. Right? And then he's like, something, something, oh, your Gentile mouth can't pronounce this. And then Terry's like, actually, I'm Jewish. Yeah. And then he said something like really risque and profane about something like just really misogynistic. And then Terry shot back like, that was, that was really gross. Yeah. <laughs> well, <no>, she's Terry gross. <laughs> she's like, that was really, that's, why would you say that? <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, I love this moment. Because, of course, like I said, like Terry and I are tight. And you can totally, anybody who, who loves Terry Gross could totally hear her saying that. Yeah. That was really gross, that thing. I, I totally hear her saying that. Yeah, and you just, you just want to, how could you not realize Terry Gross was Jewish? I don't know. That's, I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, gosh. My last name is Grossberg. And every possible permutation of that, I have been called. Yeah. Yeah. So Gross, Grossman. Gross yeah. Bart. No doubt, no doubt, yeah, yeah. For them Philip Roth fans out there, gross part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so where I was going with that is to ask you, has anybody ever walked out on your podcast? And if not, what are you doing wrong? Like, <laughs> maybe they maybe they should. No, I mean, isn't there something fun about that kind of, like, you know, that kind of spontaneous moment? No has, to this state, no one has actually walked out. <laughs> because I... I mean, wouldn't that be cool, though? It would be like, cool. Like, I don't know, like... like yeah. yeah, I mean, I, like to have. I mean, shouldn't you have at least one show like that? Like, I don't want to be the dick to do it, but uh, I mean, somebody, somebody to actually like, and like there could be the sound of the mic hitting the table or yeah. something. There is um, there's an episode of a podcast I like called WTF with Mark Maron. Uh huh. You, are you aware of Mark Maron, the stand-up comedian? The name is really familiar. He's a Jewish comedian. Okay, and he, he's like, he's got the top podcast, the most famous, whatever you know. And there was this. He was interviewing another comedian named Gallagher. Oh, I know who he is. He's a, he's he's also a, a right wing son of a um, yeah. yeah. And that interview was was Mark talking to Gallagher, trying to confront him. Like, what what's up? With all this like really racist and like yeah, homophobic things you say. Right. He's disgusting. Yeah. At some at some point they were doing it in like in a hotel room because he was like on the road doing stand up or whatever. Right. And Gallagher was like, so, why do you keep asking me all this? Blah, blah, blah. I can't, I'm not going to take this. He just walks out of the room. And that was the only episode he's ever had where someone walked out. You should have at least one. So, um, that's it. Do you remember what this is? We, we can talk about what faculty on this campus you can interview that might make that likely. Do you, do you remember in the eighties, the, um, the Gallagher HBO specials? Did you ever watch those? I was not. Even though I'm a stand-up connoisseur, yeah, I would say based on what I know about Gallagher, I have not pursued, I have not perused his material. So, so it was back then. I mean, like like America generally, he's become more. Um, I, you know, I don't know if he's become uglier and more racist or just more forthright about it. <laughs> but in the '80s, in those in those routines, it, it was not apparent. And and his thing, um, his his. He had a few things, but you know, he used to smash fruits and vegetables with a sledgehammer on stage and people would bring plastic and, um, and he was, he was funny. He was, he was, I mean, granted I was 17, 18, but he was funny. It, it's, it's just sort of crazy, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, uh, just, you know, like, like what happens, you know? There might not be an episode where someone walks out of my show ever because of the way I operate. In the case of like the episode of Gallagher with Gallagher on WTF with Mark Marin, it was because he was really trying to like confront him about it, right? I don't want to confront anyone about anything. I just why not? Based on the aesthetic of the show, it's just me talking to people, having fun, and like the most successful episodes I would say are the ones where we spend an hour just trying to make each other laugh. Like to me, like that's like L I T E. Like, come on, no, it's a really good question. Why not? Why not? Like, and I, I want to ask this. I want to put you on the spot now as a representative of your generation, which is sort of ridiculous. <laughs> but why not? A little bit of of conflict and or pushing people. People do really fascinating things. Some of us reveal ourselves in our most rich and complex when we're under a little pressure. I suppose it would depend on what kind of guest I have on. Fair enough. Like, say, yeah. someone. I actually don't like, 
like say James Patterson. The novelist? Yeah. Okay. Like I don't like his writing. Oh, okay. Got it. Like, but even then I don't want to be confrontational. I wouldn't even talk about his work. I would just be like, hey, James, what, what up? Jim, hey, Jimmy. <laughs> but, but wouldn't it like, all right, so you're interviewing faculty in our department, right? Like, and you're um, probably privy to scuttlebutt. How do you mean? Like, you know, like, gossip. Like, yeah, like, like things students say about, you know, like, like, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> right, like, I'm sure, you know, stuff. And yeah, and, and, and you probably right, because my colleagues and I, we actually get along terrific in this department, which is not always true. But, but we, we, we know each other in, in a way very different than students know us. And in some ways, you know us better than we know each other, because we don't see each other as we are in those classes, right? Yeah. Like, you have this vantage we don't have. So, so there's a way in which you're, you could ask a question to, you could ask, you know, like Professor X, you know, like word out on the street is that you do this in class um, and some students find it, you know, kind of why, you know, um, can you Z explain things could be opened up like I could learn things about my colleagues. I don't know. Okay. And, and one of them, if you asked a really bad question, like, you know, people say in class, you're really boring and you do it on purpose because you hate your job. Can you talk about it? Somebody might walk out. You could have a Terry Gross Gene Simmons moment. I suppose I could. That would be really delicious. But I would say for me as an I, auditor, that I would think be really that would delicious. also make for good content to listen to. It would, but perhaps not. It does. I don't think it fits into the aesthetic of the show. Fair enough. Because fair I'm enough. I'm so flippant about the the format and the content. Like I told you about the website, the description is all, and the way I behave on the show. Especially if it's like, say, one of my peers, just another student, and we're just making each other laugh the whole time doing stupid stuff. Yeah. Right? The, um, there's a reason why I'm listing this under comedy. In the, like, the, but the is, pod- is, is laughter enough? That <laughs> No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Like, you know, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe, you know, we're here for 70 or 80 years. We should just laugh and eat good food and yeah. have good sex and then die. Or maybe maybe it's it's to wrestle with more complicated issues and to really, you know, like try to figure out the tough questions. I mean, um, on some of the episodes, based on because of how the conversation goes, I do end up getting into like deepish talks about things. Like say, Okay, but that ish kind of worries me. Okay, so like say like um, the difference between deep and deepish is like the difference between like <laughs> it's been deep, it's gotten deep before. Like <laughs> like say with um okay, all right, like all right, like say me. um on Mark's episode, yeah, um we got into a talk about Dior. that doesn't count. Mark Mark Blackwell is just deep. deep Getting deep, deep <laughs> with Mark Blackwell is not. I get that. You you get no credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Yeah. Well, can I still? Yeah, yeah. I'm my market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like there was a there was a good portion of it uh, of us talking about. We both happened to leave STEM fields to study English. Okay. And about how like our relationship, our relationships to our parents when we were like in college, making this decision to like I don't want to study English, and how that how they might have responded, behaved to that decision, and how it what it means to be an adult at that time to like make your own decisions about what you want to do with your life yeah and in fact a lot of these on a lot of these episodes i'm explaining to people who aren't familiar with my story as a a, a, my career as a college student talking about how my direction in i barely graduated high school i went to college right afterward but like I couldn't do it. I didn't care at the point I wanted. I dropped out. And then like I finally realized what I want to do in my life. I went to community college and I transferred here. And now I'm like have this ambitious curriculum to fill like three and a half majors. There's all this stuff like the next thing after that that Mark and I talked about was like the origins of artistic compulsion in terms of like musicians, writers, poets who feel like they just can't not like do their do their thing. They're like they're writing or they're playing of music or whatever. So, okay. All right. So let's say then we, we give you the, we, 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 excuse me, remove the Mark Blackwell kind of, you know, you know, like, like spur to deepness. Do you think that, um, I don't know, like if, if comedy is the, if, if you're listed under comedy, is that kind of, would that, is that, is that a less funny discussion and therefore a less successful one? How do you mean? Well, I don't know. I mean, you're talking about the podcast is being sort of funny and I'm, I'm asking if... Um, Based on my sensibilities is mostly me trying to be funny. But then there are times when I give into the energy of the conversation. I do. And we do end up talking about stuff like that. Yeah. 
Well, maybe, you know, in that way, it's a little bit like being, I guess, you know, it's like a collaborative conversation. That's, that's what yeah. teaching is like. I'm that sure. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like if you, if you impose your agenda too intensely, you shut down the conversation. And if you don't impose it at all, the conversation can be really, really dull. So I guess maybe there's a kind of mm -hmm. like middle place or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to, I don't mean to cut us short, but you do have to go teach. I do. I do. Is it, is it almost time? Ugh, I got to say it is. It is. That's. That's good because I'm. I need those ten minutes to get my head clear. So thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for being yeah. on the show. No, it's a pleasure. And it, was it? It was fun. Yeah, it was better than fun. <laughs> I have higher, higher. I want more than fun out of it. It was interesting, and I also learned something. So cool. It was fun, interesting, and educational. Three thumbs up. Cool. And um, if you ever want to come back on later, I'll be welcome to it. Well, good, good. I would, I, I, I would love I that. There, there's so much more we could talk about. There, there is, and I wanna, I wanna listen to others. I listened to Marks and Brian's, but. I didn't listen to Aaron's and I thought I felt embarrassed about that on the way. And so I'm going to, I'm going to shortly. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. All, All right. right, cool. I'm going to get, get my butt in gear. Benson, that was fun. Thank you for the conversation. Likewise. Uh, they, my, my colleagues said you're a good talker and they didn't in any way uh, mislead me. Uh, <laughs>